was a pivotal year because we had committed, perhaps unwisely, but in the retrospect not, uh, to have an answer by an answer to the whole question by somewhere in, the, in April of uh, 1973. We took a trip to Europe, and this was Eric Walbaum, uh, who was on the symbol committee, Alan Haberman and I, and we visited all the companies that we knew had an interest. We went to Sweden and we, we saw Sweda, who was working on a system. We went down to Ankerwerk uh, in Bielefeld, Germany, and that was kind of humorous because uh, at the time, Bielefeld's pretty small, uh, a, a pretty small city, and there was only one hotel there called the Bielefelter. And I remember we got there about eight o'clock at night. This is Eric Walbaum and Alan Haberman, and the guy running the hotel was from the local lo was community. Uh, Walbaum was from Greenbelt Consumer Cooperative. He was the CEO of Greenbelt Consumer Cooperative. Anyway, the guy greeted us with a green uh, apron. If you got the picture, a little tiny hotel, Bielefeld, Germany, and we get into uh, the elevator and he takes us up to the third floor. We get up to the third floor, we each had a separate room. The doors were e easily three inches thick. And they must have been made of solid steel. We each went to our room, doors closed, clunk, and the, the, uh, the men's room was down the hall. It was a common men's room. Well, to make a sh long story short, those two guys and I, we couldn't sleep. This was just too much to ask. So we went out to a local bar, and we, we basically drank until <laughs> we had to clean up and go to the meeting with Anchorver. And we went to Anchorver. Uh, we were traveling with a, uh, we had a rental car. We had a, a, a Mercedes. And, and I remember that we went there, and again, there was the proverbial green tablecloth. And the head of Anchorverk sat at the head of the table, and his people sat in descending order of their authority. And we were at the, at the, uh, in, in the table. We were just trying to figure out, are you guys interested? And the first question is, what kind of a Mercedes are you driving? Turns out that's important, uh, which we didn't realize. And then we got on, and we had a great conversation. And they said, well, we're going to take you to lunch. It was about 12 o'clock. We said, no, no, just bring some sandwiches in, you know. We're pretty casual. Well, that, that really upended their plans for a grand lunch, which uh, I later found out was one of the things you did when you visited uh, executives in Germany. Anyway, they responded gracefully. And by the time we got the sandwiches, they were, they were like developed by artists. They were the most magnificent sandwiches, little tiny sandwiches that you could imagine. We had a great time, bid them farewell and then down on to visit the folks at Zellweger uh, in, in Zurich. Uh, and they were wonderful, cooperative, and, um, and continued on to virtually the end of the project, uh, contributing uh, to our knowledge, our understanding uh, of uh, their solution as well as others. So that was, our, that was our European, our one and only European trip. At this point, IBM, again, thanks to Marvin, uh, geared up uh, uh, to really get even more deeply involved, and they offered us the use of a system that they called PITAS, Pictorial Intersector Dissector and Analyzer System, uh, in an effort to define the then state of the art of printing with respect to line edge irregularity and void content. And so we went out, in fact, I was part of this, we went out and we bought hundreds, uh, many hundreds of packages that represented every type of substrate, every type of printing process, every, uh, every coding, and every combination thereof. And we cut the T out of the net weight, and we submitted the, that, those T's. Those or maybe we gave them just the cans, I forget what. But anyway, then IBM used their PITUS system to statistically determine the then uh, uh, state of the art in line edge irregularity and void content. Now, you might think, well, why, why bother? Well, if you're going to be scanning bars, you need to know where they ended and where they stopped uh, and started, and you needed to make sure you didn't inadvertently assume that when you went through a void that it was the end of a symbol, or rather of a bar. We ended up having more accurate, more statistically viable information than any other institution in the entire world. And so when a flexographic printer would come and say, we can't deal with this, we'd say, well, you know, we, we looked at uh, 700 flexographic packages with different substrates and different coatings, and the answer is 
here we are, we'll give you the documents. And so we became pretty good at, at being able to defend ultimately the decisions that we made. That was extremely important. Uh, we attempted at this point to get NRMA, National Retail Merchants Association, these are the, the department stores and so forth, and uh, I won't mention the name, but uh, there were two gentlemen there that absolutely wanted to have nothing to do with the grocery, grocery industry, so they stonewalled us, and we gave up and, uh, and let them do their own thing, uh, which, of course, you may know that they later uh, came aboard, and you can, it's hard to find a department store uh, that isn't using uh, a UPC symbol. The uh, checker accuracy, remember I said earlier that one of the problems with checkers was that they were fast but not necessarily accurate. And most people assume that the accuracy, uh, the lack of accuracy favored the store. Well, what we did is we got a team of people uh, to rent uh, motor homes. And we went throughout the United States, we had I think 20 or 30 stores where we arranged to have the team arrive in the parking lot and offer shoppers who were leaving the store to recheck their groceries to make sure that they were properly charged. And we offered $10 and we ended up with thousands of uh, checks, uh, checks on checkers. And the answer, ladies and gentlemen, the answer is that the error favors the consumer. And why would you think that? Why would you conclude that? Well, we concluded it statistically, but when you think about it, if a checker isn't clear about a price, it's smudged or let's suppose it's not on the item, you think they're going to charge too much and, and risk a fight with a consumer? No. They're going to charge something very low. And so the store loses and the consumer gains. So we, there's a few percentage points of, uh, of profitability that were inherent and built into our model uh, with regard to the benefits of this uh, automation process. Um, there was one funny thing that happened. We were doing a store check uh, in, uh, in one of the New York uh, uh, boroughs, and, uh, uh, and it was going along quite well, no problem, no arguments, uh, and the police showed up, and they demanded to know what was going on inside these motor homes with these women. And they, apparently, somebody <laughs> had misunderstood what we were doing, or maybe they were unhappy that they weren't picked, uh, but we explained to the policemen that we were simply checking the checker and uh, they went away laughing. So that was kind of funny. Uh, but it actually did happen. Uh, now at this point, the code committee picks uh, DNB, Distribution Number Bank, uh, to administer the codes and the guidelines. And since we were now dealing with a very simple process, there was no intent that we would communicate 10-digit codes to anybody but rather that DNB would simply, with instructions and guidelines, assign code numbers to manufacturers, and later on we agreed that we had to also assign uh, code numbers, that is manufacturer code numbers, to distributors who had uh, private label product. Uh, but that's it. That's all we were going to do. And we were also going to have guidelines with regard to where to put the code number, how big it had to be on the cases and so forth. Uh, and, that, and DNB then took on the assignment uh, to do that. It later, it later um, was transferred to uh, a minuscule company uh, run by Dick Menlin, I believe. Dick was, remember NCR, Dick was one of the people at NCR who was always helpful, always involved, and ultimately uh, he ended up being instrumental in, uh, in administering the vital uh, process of assigning code numbers. Uh, now, at this point, we began to understand, again, another fundamental, and that is, although it was a 10-digit code, it was feasible that if there were five uh, zeros in a row, and there had to be, I think, two in the front five, and at least three in the second five, you didn't have to actually uh, uh, print a symbol that represented all 10. You could zero suppress the symbol. And that was exceedingly important uh, technological understanding that we were provided. Again, must have been Joe Woodland uh, that came up with that idea. Uh, so that for very small pharmaceutical items uh, that were precisely printed but very small packages, we uh, could give uh, a manufacturer number to those companies so they could produce symbols that were zero suppressible. 
So that was really important uh, because um, uh, small packages were a real challenge. And uh, the tricky part for us was a legal problem. Could we advantage one manufacturer over another by arbitrarily assigning one manufacturer a limited number of zero suppressible code numbers, uh, there's manufacturer numbers, uh, at the expense of someone else? Uh, and so we, we got around that. Uh, and to my knowledge, we never got sued. Uh, but maybe there's an opportunity. Who knows? Uh, the next thing that happened was uh, we realized that the FDA had already established a nine-digit uh, item code system, and it had swept through the, the drug industry and the health-related items industry. And we would love, we had loved to figure out a way to, um, uh, to be able to be compatible with that code. And we uh, came up with the idea that if we gave them one of our number system designator codes, in this case, three, and then we could subsume their entire coding system within ours. And we did that, and we got their approval, and the rest is history. Uh, the National Drug Code is, in fact, uh, subsumed within the UPC code system. Uh, I mentioned earlier that the private label producers had to get code numbers. We, we got past that problem. And then we ended up with a problem. Remember the GE discussion, uh, where they couldn't live with five digits. Uh, there was always a fight going on as between a manufacturer who had, let's say, multiple divisions, uh, even multiple corporations, and they wanted multiple numbers. And we only had so many numbers. Remember, if we, if we stayed with the zero number set, there was only uh, 100,000 numbers. Uh, so we, were, we resisted issuing more than one number per manufacturer. That was a constant battle that continued for a long time. Uh, it, didn't, it didn't disrupt the process. So it just made it a little more difficult. Um, now, another interesting thing occurred in this, uh, in this situation. Um, and that is the, the Europeans, I said there was only one trip. There was actually two trips. Uh, and I made the second trip to Europe because the Germans and the French were wrestling with a European code numbering system. And as you might guess, the European, the Germans and the French didn't necessarily agree. And they were having a big convention in, uh, in Vienna. And so I was invited to present what was going on in the United States. And I got there uh, in the auditorium. There must have been five or 10,000 people in the auditorium. And there were speeches after speeches. My assignment was to come on. I was the last speaker before lunch. OK, that's fine. And I had something like 50 or 60 slides. It was going to be a magnificent presentation. And uh, the, they were talking and talking and talking. And one guy get up, another guy get up. And the, the people were dribbling out. But there was still quite a few people. Uh, until two speakers before me, and then they dribbled out some more. And by the time they turned the mic over to me, it was 10 minutes before 12. And they said that the whole thing had to be done in 10 minutes. And of course, at that point, everyone was rushing to get a seat at the, at the, at the dining table. And so when I took the mic, there were about 20 people in the audience. So, and I only had 10 minutes to present 60 slides. So OK, I, I understand. I got it now. But that wasn't the end of it. Uh, they invited me to join uh, one of the delegates delegations uh, for dinner. And they assigned me to the French delegation. And so we drove for miles out of Vienna to a magnificent restaurant. And all of them spoke French and no English. And I spoke English and no French. So it was a fairly interesting dinner, enjoyable dinner. But we didn't make a lot of progress on exchanging ideas. Uh, anyway. <laughs> 